And I think I'm also interested in the case because it helped precipitate a shift in how antitrust enforcers and scholars think about labor markets. I think it started to undermine this idea that labor markets are generally competitive and lay the groundwork for today's thinking where it's widely recognized that labor markets are often highly concentrated and that employers engage in all sorts of unfair practices, including no poach and non compete agreements. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jean. Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie Overton. I'm a partner at Alston in Berg, and I'm interested in these issues because it's important for companies that want to be compliant to understand what the law is and understand uh, that it may they may need to be focused on areas of compliance that historically have been in a blind spot. And so uh, I also had the pleasure of working with Jean at the Justice Department, although I did not work on this particular um, matter. But I like this uh, case as an example of how the law can, um, can evolve and how it can be bipartisan too and so because the uh, I will talk a little bit later about how some of the things that the Trump administration has done that have continued with um, the the important work that the Obama administration did in this area. So I'm, I'm Gene Kimmelman and uh, President of Public Knowledge and I want to thank Congressman Cicilline, Chairman Cicilline for the introduction and for coming here tonight and you were all too kind. I didn't spearhead. <laughs> I am honored to have been part of a team <laughs> that, that led this effort. Um, and I will talk a little bit more later about how this really wasn't remarkable, shouldn't have been remarkable. This was truly the day-to-day uh, -day work of the antitrust division when it just does its job and enforces the law and is indifferent to which companies are involved uh, and uh, which CEOs might have been involved and whether it's uh, labor, or it's a supplier, or it's a purchaser, or it's a consumer, um, the focus of the enforcement is really on uh, straightforwardly understanding when people are abusing the marketplace. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, that experience and why I think it's important for what is coming with the great work that Chairman Cicilline is doing. Great. That's a great introduction, uh, but I think folks need to learn a little bit more about this case. So I'm going to ask Leslie if you can um, give us a, a little summary about what this case was and what it was about. Okay, I'm going to give us a little summary about uh, this case, but I'm also going to do throw in a little bit about a couple of um, of other cases. And right. so, um, so the case against uh, Adobe, Apple, Google, Intel, Intuit, and Pixar was uh, the first that the Obama administration had brought, and that was in um, September 2010. And they settled it at the same time that they filed a case. But it, it was um, it was significant. I, I think Gene makes an excellent point that it was the division doing their job, but it got a lot of attention. Um, and because you, these were agreements among uh, these, uh, I suppose, uh, top uh, top brand name companies that were uh, anti that were alleged to be anti competitive and were the anti competitive agreements were alleged to go to the highest levels of the company of the companies and so uh, and what what were the agreements well the in terms of Adobe Apple Google <laughs> Intel Intuit and Pixar they had a number of agreements, bilateral agreements, and so one between Apple and Google, one between Apple and Adobe, et cetera, um, to not cold call each other's employees. And so what do I mean by cold call? So having, um, having recruiters calling people who are not necessarily in the market, and so top talent uh, at other companies and trying to solicit them to consider another opportunity that could be better paying, could have better benefits, could just be an opportunity for those employees to be competed for. And um, by having these agreements that there would be no cold calling between these companies, that was depriving these, um, these employees of the benefits of, of well-functioning labor markets uh, in terms of the education that these folks had attained, the skill sets that they had attained, and so when they can't 
be con they can't get a call about an opportunity at Apple because Apple uh, has uh, as Google on a don't call list and vice versa, that is um, not leading to well-functioning um, uh, labor markets. And so that's that's what the focus that's what the focus really was on for those particular uh, cases. There were some there were some others also. There was a case against Lucasfilm, and where the complaint and settlement there was uh, a few months later in 2010. And there, that was a little more um, complicated. It went beyond the no cold calling, and uh, there was an agreement. There was a three-part protocol. There was an agreement um, that Lucasfilm um, and Pixar would would uh, notify each other when making an offer to someone at the firm, and there was an agreement that they would not do a counter offer above the initial offer. And so, what I find interesting at uh, in, in terms of the Lucasfilm and Pixar uh, situation is uh, those were rivals not just in the market for the labor, but those are rivals, however you cut it, as, as animation studios. And so there, um, it's it's particularly surprising that uh, that folks weren't paying uh, more attention. So, and then there was another, but that that case uh, settled at the same time that the complaint was filed. There was another case involving eBay and Intuit, and um, that was filed in California in 2012, but it wasn't settled until 2014. So it went into litigation and eventually settled. And that there, you saw um, you saw Meg Whitman uh, being involved in uh, emails and the agreements. You saw the founder of Intuit. Uh, having correspondence saying that um, he would get on his people to not uh, slip up on the agreement. And he just very, very clearly, these agreements, their agreements were going to the highest levels of the organizations. And, um, and uh, the founder of Intuit was serving on eBay's board. And so somehow he got into his mind that that meant that there should be a no poach arrangement with uh, eBay because of the, the board relationship. But, but that wasn't what the antitrust laws uh, provided for. So I'm happy to answer questions, but I want to just keep, allow us to keep moving. That's great. Go ahead, James. So I want to jump in on that. So the, the thing I said is that it, it was straightforward. Straightforward um, in, in the way Leslie went through it, but the, um, just to give you a little color of how this, how this plays out, you have a lot of very, very um, well-known antitrust lawyers coming into the division, and this is not uncommon, basically, without revealing anything specific, saying, you know, this is the way business is done in Silicon Valley. This is the way things work. Um, nobody gets hired off of cold calls. You know, this was just kind of the way. So you get a whole broad discussion of what is the culture, what's the way in which this marketplace works, and what you have to do in the antitrust division is dig through all of that and try to understand whether there is a legitimate basis for it, whether that truly reflects the way everyone behaves. Um, are we just happening to see five companies' documents by chance? And so you go out and look at a lot of other documents, and you make sure you get the whole universe of that. And then what you also get is, um, you know, in employment arrangements, there are a lot of different kinds of employment arrangements, and these are very highly technically skilled people, and you have to have a lot of different kinds of ways of working with them. They deal with trade secrets, they deal with, you know, patents, a lot of intellectual property. This is really complicated and highly proprietary. We can't make, we can't have people jumping around. So there's a whole variety of arguments being put out here. When you see it at the tail end, and you say, well, that was pretty straightforward. They did this, they did that, they did these things, and therefore they broke the law. It never looks that way at the beginning. And the division had to go through all of it, all of this. And um, the other thing I'll just say is um, in, in the context, and, and this was small, um, but it was we were well aware that we were doing something that was not entirely typical as much as it, for us, was straightforward enforcement of the antitrust laws, the people didn't think that much about labor markets and didn't think that maybe these kind of practices were that big a deal. 
Um, uh, and maybe with a lot of talk, even then, about what are you going to do about Google, and what are you going to do about concentration in the agricultural sector, and what are you going to do about healthcare? There was a lot of other competing interests of where you put your resources and where you, uh, where you, where you put your, your, your attorneys and economists to really spend their time. Um, there was a commitment to the idea that we needed to be careful about leveraging in the marketplace, what's often called monopsony power, and that labor was a significant portion of what needed to be considered under the antitrust laws. So even if it was a small precedent, even if it was not um, ballyhooed as the big case, um, the, um, the idea was to make sure that we were standing for the principles that were, um, that were really at stake. And there was an understanding that um, when the government sues in these kind of instances, which is often not fully understood, um, you're not necessarily going to stop all that behavior in the marketplace. These are individual cases, individual fact patterns, very specific to the case. But it was um, understood, and you never get money for doing this. This is like an injunction to stop the behavior. Um, but there was an understanding that this could be valuable to these employees, even if you couldn't undo what had happened, that there's private antitrust. There's state officials who can look at these things. There is the entire labor movement that could become aware that this is something that they can actually pay attention to and that they have legal tools at their hands. So it's not always just about the smallness of the case. It's also about what else, what other opportunities you create for law enforcement down the road. And so those are important pieces of the puzzle. And for the, for the people who worked for the Assistant Attorney General at the time, Christine Marty, there was a strong desire to want to um, you know, put down a marker in this area, uh, even if it was quite small. I'll just um, make another point. One of the issues in all of these cases was the standard. What should the standard be under antitrust law for these types of agreements? Should they be viewed as uh, unlawful per se, so you just look at them and you don't need to get into a big, um, uh, a big debate, you don't need to get into a heavy analysis because they're really just unlawful on their face? Or do they merit a balancing test of their harms and their benefits? And so, and the position that the Department of Justice was taking was that these are naked um, agreements, anti-competitive agreements that are not the type that are um, reasonably necessary to a pro-competitive collaboration and where you would say, oh, we've got to have a robust analysis balancing the harms and um, the, uh, the benefits, but these no, these should be struck down as unlawful on their face. And that, I would say that is the position that um, the Justice Department has continued to take, uh, although with, I will say with one exception in the franchise um, context where you've got uh, a provision preventing one franchisee from poaching another franchisee, the Justice Department has taken that as and said, well, that should be the, uh, the rule of reason, this balancing test. And so, because that is, um, that should be this balancing <laughs> test. But, but other than that, I would say in, when you're dealing with, or, with horizontal competitors for, um, for employees, the Justice Department has continued to take this, uh, this standard position that uh, was done when Gene and um, Christine Barton and others <coughs> So, final, final point. Okay. Go, on, go on to the broader issues, less against yeah. the rest The fact that it was um, a complaint that was filed that has a per se violation of the law is extremely important for what Leslie said. But to be, a, and again, people said, why did you settle and why wasn't it criminal and why didn't you go push harder and further? And, um, you know, those are good questions. At the time, it was pushing as far as we thought we could to get a settlement where the end result was stopping the behavior and actual in, internal compliance practices in the companies that were training and um, follow-up to the highest level that were, no more, that were no less than what we thought we would actually get if we had gone to court. And we weren't sure in court whether it would be deemed per se versus rule of reason. So there was a risk factor there. So the value of 
the settlement, when there was never going to be money at stake anyway, was to be able to um, uh, really lock in the notion that these should be treated as per se violations. Great. All right, well, I think that's some really helpful framing. Um, but I'm also interested in sort of the result for today. What are sort of the impacts that we've seen now at, um, because of this uh, investigation and the settlements? Um, and, and how are workers uh, benefiting or, or still facing problems today? Um, so I think I'd like everyone to, to address this one. Someone who's interested to start. <laughs> I'm, jump, I'm jumping quickly. Um, I think one big impact has been on compliance training and on how this is this is on companies' radar in a way that it was not before. And so that case has has led to other cases, has led to um, again just this emphasis within compliance. So uh, I, I I've got to believe that there are employees who have benefited from better. Um, awareness and adherence to uh, compliance in this area. And one thing that the Obama administration did near the end of the administration was they put out guidance that uh, these no post agreements can be treated, can be pursued criminally. And that is something that got a lot of attention as well. And so um, I think there were people who thought that when the Trump administration came in, the Trump administration would back away from that, but they did not. And they, um, you know, they doubled down on that. They haven't brought a criminal case yet, but they have said that um, you know, that continues to be their policy that this, these could be criminal. Great. Anyone else? Sure. From the enforcement side, there has been significant bark. Uh, the Obama administration in 2016 put out the guidelines that Leslie mentioned, and Assistant uh, Attorney General Del Rahim has affirmed those guidelines and pledged to criminally prosecute wage fixing among employers, but the action hasn't quite met those promises. So for instance, there was a case that the FTC, I believe is in the process of settling, involving two therapy staffing companies that conspired with each other to hold down the wages of therapists who work with the companies. And in that case, the FTC agreed to a civil settlement in which there was no there were no monetary penalties and the companies didn't even have to admit wrongdoing. So there's still a big disconnect between the rhetoric and official statements of the agencies and what they're actually doing in practice. Great. I, have, I don't want to derail it, uh, but just to you know, respond on sort of what has labor taken any lessons from this case and um, or, or more organized labor, primarily working in low-wage industries. And I think, um, if anything, they've actually seen antitrust used against efforts to organize mm -hmm. among um, workers or individuals deemed as independent contractors or, or independent and colluding to kind of create some type of base pay or, or something like that. So, so I think that there is, and, and you've seen that happen a number of times, I think, in Seattle, when some drivers tried to organize lobstermen in Maine. Um, so there is sort of these two sides of how this tool can be used, and I think I absolutely agree with you that it should be used more in these instances where if you would look at where the power is held, who actually has most of the power to manipulate the labor market, that should be part of the consideration. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I, ha I actually have another question for you. Um, what are some of the other policies that tech companies are using today? I understand no poach is not as commonly used as we've talked about, um, but what are some of the other tools that they use to um, sort of impact workers' mobility? Yeah, so um, Data Society, I should explain, looks at uh, tech companies primarily as platforms for labor markets. But we also are fully aware of how they are enormous employers themselves. And on the, on the second question of them as tech companies as employers, um, we've seen this universe of employees within tech really diversify on a number of levels. First of all, I think everyone may have seen that a uh, recent article that showed that 40% of, or over, 40, over half of Uber's staff are contractors. So that's one way in which that um, you can 
really restrict uh, the earnings, the growth potential, the movement by keeping people who are doing the exact same work with on the campus as well as off the campus separate and control that. Um, I think something that someone else who probably has a ton more uh, understanding of can speak about is non-competes, which uh, prevent um, employees from leaving and going into another uh, to work for a competitor, which is is something that actually is used um, up and down the, the wage scale and across all industries, including in industries where where issues of proprietary knowledge or highly secretive trade secrets, um, trademark, whatever is not an issue. Um, and then, particularly in certain service industries, they use, and this is, I don't, I, we, I think sometimes it's written, but I think it's more like a, um, a nonverbal statement that employees who want more hours have to have open availability, I meaning you have to keep your entire schedule available to one employer. So if that's the case, then you couldn't possibly schedule anything with another employer because you have to keep all of your hours open. So there are different ways that that um, also occur. Uh, in terms of uh, tech companies as um, as sort of uh, platforms for employment, I think that those are less about actual agreements and written and, and written documents so much as algorithms which limit the the ability of workers to really optimize their their opportunities on a platform. So you know nudges and and controls that say, if you just drive five more hours or take eight more trips on this platform, you will reach this particular bonus or whatnot. And so it's a, it's framed as sort of a decision that employees make, but there is an algorithm that actually is seeing everything that all employees on the platform do, and so they're able to control the decisions and the movement, which I think this is really about, is sort of like worker mobility. Um, and it's not just in, in, in driving, which we're all familiar with, but also in, um, in cleaning, in uh, care. Uh, there's a, almost an Uber for everything these days. We don't know if they'll be around for real, but right now they are sort of using those, those algorithmic tools in order to manipulate and move uh, workers. Yeah, I think this is really helpful. Um, you know, we are often looking at how the tech companies are affecting consumers, um, but they are also, the, the workers are kind of the consumers of these apps. And so yes. those same sort of um, like dark patterns about trying to get the consumer to do something are also happening with workers. I think that's really interesting. Um, so I have mentioned um, the non-compete clauses, and I'd love to have Sandeep talk a little bit about um, what are non-compete clauses, um, why should we be concerned about them? Sure. So non-competes are often mentioned in the same breath as you know, coach agreements, but they are distinct. They are an agreement between an employer and its employees. So non-competes restrict the post-employment freedom of workers and limit what they can do and where they can work after leaving a job. So for example, a non-compete may prohibit an accountant from working as an accountant, including as a solo practitioner in the United States for 18 months after leaving your current job. So that's a non-compete example, hypothetical example of a non-compete. And approximately eight, 30 million workers today are subject to non-competes. And there are few sectors and occupations that are immune from them. So they've been documented among engineers, Jimmy John sandwich makers, yoga instructors, home health aides, automated speech recognition technologists, and Amazon warehouse workers. So they're really present up and down the socioeconomic spectrum. And an employee, employee who accepts a position in violation of a non-compete can face legal action. An employer can take the employee to court and prohibit him or her from accepting a new position or starting a business in violation of a non-compete. And I think importantly, even in the absence of legal action, research shows that workers generally comply with non-competes. Few workers consult a lawyer before acquiescing to a non-compete, and most workers simply accept them without question and comply with their terms. <coughs> and I think California is a really illustrative example. California is often held up as a model for how to treat non-compete clauses. In general, non-competes are unenforceable in California, so an employer can't go to court and enforce one of these agreements against a worker. But even in California, about one in six workers is bound by a non-compete. And so this suggests that employers recognize that the simple existence of a non-compete discourages worker mobility 
and serves as a method of controlling their workforce. So in other words, under a non-compete, even one that can or won't be enforced, workers are less likely to look for new work, and employers are less likely to make them offers. And the empirical evidence, which has really flourished over the past few years, documents that non-competes do restrict employee mobility, and that this reduced mobility contributes to lower wages, reduced formation of new businesses, and can lock workers into hostile and abusive work environments, which I think is especially salient at a time when Me Too is gaining currency and attention. So to address this issue, in mid-March, the Open Markets Institute, along with the AFL-CIO, Public Citizen, SEIU, and 16 other labor and public interest groups, and more than 40 advocates and scholars, petitioned the Federal Trade Commission to ban non-competes as an unfair method of competition. The FTC has clear authority to act. Congress gave the FTC authority to interpret its antitrust and competition powers. <coughs> and interestingly and notably, the Supreme Court has validated, validated the FTC's broad policymaking authority. As we explained in our petition, non-competes inflict real harms on workers and lack credible business justifications. So the question in front of us is whether the FTC, as presently composed, is willing to use its power to protect workers from these abusive contracts that rob them of their fundamental freedom to leave. Thank you. Um, so one thing I want to uh, talk about is the way that politics can sort of influence antitrust. And I think that's an important lesson to sort of learn um, for our antitrust lessons uh, from the no coach case. So Jean, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the political situation that the Obama administration was facing at the time. Um, so this case was um, one of a variety that we were looking at um, at the beginning of the Obama administration. And as probably all of you will recall, there were great expectations that the world was going to change with the Obama administration. And it was everything from health care across to, uh, uh, the, I mean, the president in the campaign had talked about the need for stronger antitrust enforcement. And so we came in, I'll just say, loaded for bear, <laughs> as much as we could be. And what you find is that it's not so easy. It's complicated. There are uh, 400 plus attorneys at the antitrust division, uh, 100 plus economists of some form or another. And um, they smile at you, and they generally say, um, we'll do what you tell us to do, and we will be here when you leave. <laughs> uh, and they've been through this a lot. Things change some, but there's a whole process of what is an investigation, and how does it occur, and how do you review a merger. And uh, so there was a lot of um, desire to do things in everything from the ag sector to the healthcare sector. Obviously, labor was important. Uh, we wanted to uh, try to set a standard for being able to actually bring back ill-gotten gains, called discouragement. There were a variety of uh, Section 2 had not been used, monopolization, no monopolization cases, and a terrible report from our perspective in the Bush administration. We walked away from it. The FTC joined us. There was a lot of exuberance about doing things. And um, there were investigations started. Uh, there was a lot of effort put in in a lot of areas, agriculture, across, and it is sometimes hard to find the facts that really will make a case. Um, and you can find a lot of things that you don't like and that are abuses, and you can even find things that you think are violations of antitrust law that somehow somebody figured out and corrected two years ago, and you see it in the documents, and you're too late. And just a lot of things that really generally never go public, but makes it much harder. And what we, um, what we found pretty quickly was that with everything we could do, we needed a lot more tools. We needed a lot more of an arsenal. We would have wanted to have the White House like fully embrace antitrust as like what they did in the campaign. Like, why aren't you here now? Well, they were doing health care. They were doing Dodd Frank. They were doing they were doing a lot of things. But somehow this had kind of like not elevated to that level. And when you're dealing with heads of other agencies, they have different priorities. They have their personalities and their e. So it just gets really complicated um, to get a lot of things done. 
But I'll just say, in general, there was a desire, there was an enthusiasm, there was enormous efforts put into things that never saw the light of day because we couldn't get a case out of it, or we couldn't get the kind of cross-agency collaboration to do something. And if I talk about industries like airlines, you'll understand the kind of problems we have. Or I talk about concentration and abuses in, among agribusiness, you might know something about that too. Um, all I can say is that it was never out of a lack of desire to do something, but there was often a difficulty of getting to a meaningful finish line. So I'm just going to ask two more questions because I want to give the audience uh, time to ask their questions. So start thinking about your questions now. Um, so what's one lesson that you think we should take from this case? We're going to watch the documentary and, and that'll teach us some lessons, but what are some lessons that you think um, we should take from this? I'll give this one. Um, that folks in, in organizations need antitrust counseling, they need uh, compliance training because again, you see people at the top of these organizations, you see jobs and, and the equipment, you see these folks who are writing emails or, or talking about um, what they did in, in, in books. It just, it just doesn't make, doesn't, it's surprising uh, on the one hand, but if, if it's just important to remember that Everybody in an organization needs to know that um, they're not above the antitrust laws. And I'll say the lesson I think is the flip side of that, which is you're never going to change the marketplace completely in one case with one company or in one set of companies. This is a long-term fight, whether it's antitrust or it's other policies or a combination of the two. Um, a few companies might get the signal and the message. But it will not permeate across the market. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, both within antitrust and then truly across the government, to change a lot of these behaviors. So, I'm going to sound a somewhat critical and maybe provocative note, but I think that the DOJ was absolutely right to plead the no poaching case as a per se violation. What was done by the companies and the executives in that case has been per se illegal for decades, and arguably since the very early days of the antitrust laws of the 19th century. But if you look at the remedies, that, you know, the DOJ accepted a civil settlement in which none of the wrongdoers were even publicly identified. And I think this case, along with the DOJ's anti-cartel enforcement program, is symbolic of something deeper in American society, the two-tier justice system. So, for decades, the Demo um, DOJ, under both Democratic and Republican administrations, have condemned cartel activity and stated that criminal investigations and prosecutions are the correct response. And the Supreme Court has described collusion as the supreme evil of antitrust. And at least against many small-time price fixers, the DOJ has been ready and eager to use its full legal arsenal but when Steve Jobs, Eric Schmidt, and other leading lights of Silicon Valley engaged in a horizontal conspiracy against workers, they did not face these usual sanctions. Instead, they were left off with a warning and not even named and shamed by the government. And it took a private class action filed four years later to reveal that these titans were actually at the center of this conspiracy. This wasn't something between middle managers, but involved the highest ranks of Silicon Valley. So I think. Going forward, the agent DOJ in particular has to commit to using its criminal enforcement powers against all colluders against workers, and not simply those that are not powerful or not visible. Otherwise, I think this perception will grow that, just like in so many other areas of law, we have a two-tier justice system, leniency for the elite, draconian punishments for the rest of us. Um. Okay, well, I have, I have no other uh, suggestions. Um, I think maybe what I'm here to do is sort of provoke um, your thinking that maybe in this case there was a lot of documentation, there was clear evidence there was, uh, that th this was happening, but maybe we should also think about the ways in which it's less visible. Whether it's through an algorithm, whether it's asking employees to have open availability, um, 
whether it's the fact that we're talking about tech companies and a lot of them are moving towards the, the very goal is monopoly and part of how they get that is through their network effects. So Uber wants all of the drivers, they want all of the consumers. So and that has to do with both controlling both sides. And to to Charlotte's case, if you look at most um, platform companies, most tech companies, and read the documents, they treat everyone as a user of their technology. Everybody is a consumer. There are no workers in in that those relationships. And so maybe that works in this case. Um, but I think that there is an importance to also think at the point of this panel to thinking about how we protect the labor market. Um, uh, and then I guess the last part would just would be how do we look at the overall effect? Not just can we follow the trail, but is there a way for us to think about the market? Like what does the effect of all of that look like? And I say that because you know maybe no coaches no longer an issue, or is less of an issue now, but how does um, how does a non-compete combined with um, uh, forced arbitration, how do these two policies work together to to lead to a desired effect, even though it may not be clear that that's where it's headed? Great, thank you. Okay, so the last question, we're here in the Congressional Visitor Center in Congress, um, so I want to think about what are some priorities that Congress should be looking at, um, some areas for change uh, that we want to encourage Congress to, to pay attention to. So I'm going to just start by saying, where's the Labor Department? <laughs> we're talking labor, we're talking antitrust, where's the Labor Department? We have an expert agency that's supposed to be taking care of the rights of workers in the marketplace. I mean, so again, this to me is let's use all the tools that we have um, to uh, to really weigh in on these issues and make sure the marketplace is is functioning. Um, uh, so I think that it's just critical that and Congress has oversight over all of this. And it's, it's Congress, it can be the White House. I mean, we were hoping it was going to be the Obama White House. It wasn't, they weren't always there to focus on this. But you can use the White House as a bully public to coordinate across government. Congress can use that power as well to really push on multiple actions at once. Because again, I don't think one thing, one thing will do it. Um, not to say one thing, I mean, they said these criticisms are totally valid. I think it's, it's important. Two-tier justice is a horrible problem. I'll just say in this case, one thing you, that is important to know about um, a criminal case versus civil case is the level, the level of intent you have to prove. It's a much higher burden. And, um, you know, again, it might have been winnable in that regard. I mean, we did what we thought was right. But I'll just say there was a danger that you could have lost those cases completely. And that it would never, the information about uh, whoever was involved in it would have never come out. So that's just a risk factor. You have to take it to effect. I'm not trying to defend it as if it's the, you know, the right answer. There could be two answers. It's just it complicates the litigation risk. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, so please. I certainly agree with Jean that addressing the radical disempowerment of workers is going to be the responsibility of many agencies obviously not limited to the DOJ and FTC by any means, but I think both agencies could be doing a lot more, and I think Congress has to use its oversight and appropriations power to really compel them to do everything they can. And I think Congress, through these functions, can pressure them to do at least three things. First is, as I mentioned earlier, bring criminal prosecutions against all employer cartels. The second is pressure the FTC to ban oppressive employment terms such as non-compete clauses. And I think the third is the agencies have to start reviewing mergers for their labor market effects, not just product market effects. So I think before giving the agencies new authority, Congress has to get them to use and exhaust their present authority. Great. Uh, and just one comment. I, I don't really work on federal level, so um, this is not my forte. I come from California, which has a very strong local state labor department who has taken up the slack on the federal level. They've expanded their role. They're willing to prosecute wage staff cases and really go after and not just win, but also collect, which is a big part of it. So I think government enforcement. 
Um, on the federal level, though, I think the PRO Act, which has been introduced, is one instance in which um, workers are trying to build to, to build some power for themselves so that they can make these structural shifts in the fact that the, the DO Department of Labor has actually been reversing a lot of the decisions of the Obama administration, and the NLRB has been basically uh, denying almost all of the the complaints that have been brought there by workers. So it, it hasn't, at least in this administration, not been an ally of workers. Those two agencies have not been an ally of workers. And so the effort is, like the other uh, presenters have said, have been to appeal to the legislative body in order to get that, the power that is needed in order to shift those dynamics. Just make a quick point. Um, others have talked about the roles of um, Congress and, and uh, the White House and the like. And so but I'll just make the point that, uh, as we saw in these early um, no-coach cases, and particularly in the eBay case, um, even within antitrust, you have the federal, but you also have state. You had, so the state of California had a case, and then there, were, um, there was private litigation too. And so all of those together can create more of a deterrent effect as well, rather than just um, um, a, a injunction by itself. That's a great point, Leslie. Thanks. Okay. Who is uh, interested to ask a question? I have a mic. Yes, okay. Connor's got the mic back there. Don't tell Jim about this one. Thanks. Hi, Bertram Lee, Policy Council with the Committee on Education and Labor. Um, and uh, speaking from a congressional level, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but we know the DOL has some oversight in this space, but um, getting the agency to at least even cooperate has been uh, incredibly difficult. Um, but I would say this from a broader perspective, as we look toward the future of work, specifically with the uberfication of the labor market with non-compete, um, the misclassification and forced arbitration clauses. We can only do but so much as a single, as one half of the legislative body of the United States. But what are some of the things that you all think we could shed a light on looking forward that would be more useful? Well, we may not be able to do the most effective means right now, not having kind of the executive branch. What are some of the things you think we could shed light on to kind of put things forward for maybe a future administration, Lord willing? <laughs> I just I just think hearings, 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 calling people up, hearing issues. I mean, open availability. How many people know about open availability? I mean, that's that doesn't that doesn't sound like the kind of thing that everybody out there in the world would think is like the greatest deal for them in terms of jobs, right? And and you know, there's there's going to be a lot of discussion about different nudges and misuse of algorithms across a whole variety of of realms um, uh, in in the digital marketplace. But to have you know, it's always great to have someone give you an incentive to work a little harder or do your job better. But how far should you go? How far is fair? Where is it pushing people to actually um, uh, um, endanger themselves or not be able to perform well or you know work in a way that, that truly is is you know harmful to their well I mean these are things I think that need discussing and airing and um, and you know I even wonder if on the, from the employer side you know given them benefit of the doubt maybe if they heard it in the worst light in a congressional hearing they would rethink some of these policies. Maybe there are other ways in which they can profit maximize without having to do some of these things. I just think that's the way to really try to push the process, but you can't fully legislate. Uh, I think maybe what I would say to that is that for a very long time, the conversation about labor has revolved around wages and benefits. And I think what we're seeing is it's also revolving around uh, more now so than it's been a long time, opportunity, like real opportunity mobility. Um, uh, Time, time, like do you, you know, and open availability is something that you see in, in retail, but as a journalist, actually you have to have open availability as a journalist as well. And I'm sure there's plenty of other occupations where sort of the boundaries of when you work um, have been stretched. And so maybe that's part of, 
of this is the discussion of future work is like moving it beyond those this very small space of how um, we think about what can we legislate. Yes, absolutely, the minimum wage is incredibly important. I'm not saying it's not, but uh, there are other ways in which if you don't get enough hours, the minimum wage really doesn't matter. Uh, I sleep on with the uh, interest of the committee. Hard to follow Bertram, we should be on the VR. Um, the, uh, <laughs> that's real smooth. Uh, yeah. So uh, a couple things. One is I wanted to circle back on the arbitration prong because Leslie um, has been a real leader in this area. She was the, the name of the brief in the Italian Colors case, um, and that's you know people are not familiar with that. That was the case involving you know a small business where there's clear and better effects, and you know, the news for Reddit just came in as a really great dissent where you know, she basically explains that the company was able to contract around the antitrust law. So to the point that we want private enforcement to complement public enforcement, that's not possible in a world where employment contracts or the contracts, consumer contracts have arbitration clauses, right? Um, so to this point, and to the point of public pressure and hearings, you know, one of the things that we had last Congress was a hearing with the CEO of Google, uh, Sundar Pichai, and you know, the congressman before and and heard from Congressman Jayapal during the hearing in a very forceful way saying it's not just about transparency, it's about access to justice or fundamental rights, right? And so that's something that, you know, it's really important to echo and clarify and say it's not just the issue of, you know, blocking people from saying their stories, it's blocking them from going to the courts to mitigate their rights altogether. So it's hoping Leslie can maybe touch base on your thoughts on arbitration and antitrust generally. Um, obviously, it's a huge component with employment, so Chairman uh, Scott, Chairman Nadler both introduced legislation to ban uh, forced arbitration in employment contracts following the Epic Systems case and to clarify the NLRA that it protects concerted activity. Um, the other thing I thought would be kind of useful to touch base on is, you know, one of the concerns people make about compete agreements is, oh, well, these are helpful to protect workplace innovations, and if I'm training my employees to make <coughs> hamburgers, how dare they go across the street? Um, one of the counter to that, of course, is that California has banned non-compete agreements and it's a pretty innovative state. Um, so I was hoping maybe they could talk about this issue, too, and it's, you know, sort of the interplay between robust competition in labor markets and innovation as well, and again, the restoring our justice system. So I'll, um, I'll just speak quickly to uh, the arbitration point. Thank you for um, mentioning that. Um, yeah, that was, uh, the Justice Department had put in an amicus brief um, in the Italian Colors case, and uh, unfortunately, the Supreme Court did not uh, agree with, with our position. Uh, I ended up testifying um, uh, in, before the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee uh, on that, and uh, I was testifying not on, not on the proposed legislation, but I was testifying on the brief. I was testifying on the on the four corners of the brief. But I think that um, you know, I think it, it the what I liked that brief because I think it really teed up the challenges that are created when you have a um, forced arbitration and in a case like an antitrust case, and uh, you've got to get an economist and you can't uh, pool with other people and share those costs, who is going to bring that case? Nobody's going to do that if you've got to, if you've got to arbitrate it and you've got to arbitrate it by yourself. And so you're not going to be able to vindicate your rights. And I think that was teed up um, well in that brief. And, um, you know, I, 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 speaking only for myself, uh, you know, I hope that that's a, an issue that doesn't get, uh, get just lost and forgotten because I think it's a, it's a real um, loss of uh, antitrust rights for a lot of people. Would anyone else like to address that question? Sure, I'll wait briefly. So in the United States, unlike most other developed countries, private enforcement is a key part of the legal enforcement regime. Especially in antitrust, Congress wanted injured consumers, workers, and businesses to play a lead role in enforcing the antitrust laws and gave injured parties this extraordinary remedy, the treble damages action. But through arbitration, big corporations have effectively immunized themselves from private antitrust suits. They can block class actions and then shuttle everything over to arbitration where individual individuals or individual businesses have to arbitrate it on a bilateral basis. And as Slade mentioned, that's rarely going to happen because these cases are extraordinarily expensive to litigate. So 
this, this term judicial activism is often bandied about, and this is really an area where there's been extraordinary judicial activism. The Supreme Court has taken this very modest statute, the Federal Arbitration Act, and reinterpreted it to give corporations carte blanche to escape private lawsuits. Thanks. Yeah, Thank you. And as I understood your description of the Silicon Valley no poach case, it's sort of like senior executives made these agreements and then the human resource officers were charged with implementing them. Do you think there's sufficient incentive for the HR officers to come forward as whistleblowers? Should other incentives be considered? Like in the False Claims Act context, you have key TAM actions with relators who get a bounty. Is that something that should be considered here? It wouldn't hurt to have whistleblower protection, that's for sure. I mean, I don't know how many people would be able to identify what, what's really an antitrust claim as opposed to something else. But if people see something that they think is unfair, that is inappropriate, that their boss is asking them to do, I think having broad federal rights to protect people that come forward and, and present that information is important. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah, I'll agree with what. I was just going to say, it's a, it's a good point. I don't, I don't think they can express it. Yeah, I agree with what Gene said. I think stronger whistleblower protections would be immensely valuable. But obviously, so long as we live in a world of at-will employment, it's going to be hard for HR people to blow the whistle on superiors, especially people in the C-suite level. Any other questions? <coughs> Well, we're getting pretty close to what I want to start the film, so I'm not going to ask a final question. Um, thank you so much to this wonderful panel. I really appreciate you being here, and we had a great conversation. Thank you.